There was a tradition in the early church that when Christians would meet each other, not just on Easter Sunday, but when they would meet each other, they would say, he is risen. And the response would be, he is risen indeed. Let's try that this morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Do you believe that? Yes. <laughs> well, the uh, early church struggled a little bit with the resurrection. And Paul in 1 Corinthians takes an entire chapter to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how important it was, how it had been validated, and the difference it would make in the life of a believer. In this first hour this morning here at Bayside, I'm going to take the very last verse of that chapter. So if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you, welcome you to open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he gives an application of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In just a moment, we want to look at it because it talks about this vain life and a not so vain life that we can live. It's wonderful to be here with the lights on, with the sun shining, with uh, your smiling faces this morning. I, I spoke at a service on Friday. It was at our home church and all the lights were off. And uh, we had a little sign outside the door of the church, please be silent as you enter. And so people came into the church and no one spoke. We had a church service that had no singing. That's an unusual church service, isn't it? But, but the reason we were doing that is because it was Good Friday. It was the day of Christ's crucifixion. And sometimes we hurry past that to get to Easter Sunday morning. But I want to remind you on this Easter Sunday morning as we speak about the resurrection that Christ died for our sins. A minister was standing behind a lady in line at the bank when there was a commotion in the counter in front of him. The customer was obviously distressed and began exclaiming, where will I put my money? I have all my money and mortgage here. What will happen to my mortgage? The minister stepped forward to see if he could be of any help. It turned out that she had misunderstood a small sign on the counter. The sign read, we will be closed for Good Friday. She had read, we will be closed for good Friday. <laughs> and she thought the bank was closing and she was going to be losing all her money. We can misunderstand what that uh, word uh, expression, good Friday, is. It's the day when Christ died. It was not good for him, but it was good for you and for me. I noticed a church in Dallas, Texas this morning was uh, celebrating Easter. They were bringing a helicopter in to drop Easter eggs in the church parking lot for everybody. The pastor claimed that he would dress up as the Easter bunny this morning. Someone on the uh, Facebook page said, in our opening hymn will be, Here Comes Peter Cottontail. And sometimes uh, we turn Easter into some sort of, of uh, commercial activity. But Easter is the time when we remember that Christ not only died, but he rose from the grave. And so I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want this message to be especially directed to those of you who are believers in Jesus Christ. In the next hour, I'm going to move back and take a look at the first number of verses in 1 Corinthians 15 of why you should be a believer. But many of you have been coming to Bayside for a number of years. Many of you have gone to other churches and you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, if this has happened, then there should be a change in your life. There should be something different. He starts off this verse with the word, therefore. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, therefore. When you study the Bible, whenever you see a therefore, you ask, what is it? Therefore. <laughs> and it, it means that it's 
what he's about to say is being based upon what he has already said. And in 1 Corinthians 15 and the first 11 verses, he has specifically talked about the fact that Christ has died, that he's been buried, and he has risen from the dead. In verses 12 through 34, he spends a great deal of time talking about the fact that since Christ has risen from the dead, it means that we too will rise from the dead. It means that life will not end when we die physically on this earth. It means that there is a future, there is a resurrection that will come. And we'll talk about that in the next hour because if you say that there is no resurrection, it means that Christ has not been resurrected. And if Christ has not been resurrected, there is no hope for you and for me. He goes on to talk about the fact that we will have glorified bodies. When Christ rose from the dead, he had a glorified body. He had a body that that was no longer subject to to the ravages of sin and decay on, on this earth. In fact, it appears that that body could come into rooms even though the door was being locked. But it was a real body and he could eat fish as he sat beside the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. Paul goes on to say that transformation of our body will occur in a moment in time, in the twinkling of an eye. Not sure about you, but I've been trying to change my physical body. I've been eating healthy rabbit food. And, and, and I, I, I've been watching how much I eat, and I've been going to the gym. My body has not been transformed in the twinkling of an eye. I want to tell you that. It's slowly changing, I believe. That's what my wife says. I think she just enjoys that I'm out of the house and I'm working hard there in the gym. But this transformation will occur in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When Christ comes back, those of us who, who are still here in the earth will, will be transformed. And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and those who have died will be raised and they will receive their new bodies in that moment as well. And death will no longer be a threat. Death will no longer be a possibility. Christ will give us victory. Just before our verse, he says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is something that every human being faces. And when you're young, you probably don't think about death a great deal. But it is amazing to know the number of young people today who are actually committing suicide, that that death seems to be a welcome thing for them, even though death is so uh, dark and unknown. Over the past 20 years, suicide rates have been on the rise in every state in the USA, except for Nevada. According to recent findings from the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, their research has found that suicide rates increased by more than 30% in half of the states from 1999 to 2016. In some states, that increase of suicide was as high as 58%. In 2016, the suicide rate was estimated to be around 13.4 out of every 100,000, making it the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. The American Association for Suicide estimates that there were 1.1 million suicide attempts in 2016. That translates to one attempt every 28 seconds. Someone in the United States two years ago, and yet death is a terrible thing, but, but they don't even have a reason to live. 
And death, the unknown, the, 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 the absence of at least the pain that's going on here seems to be welcome for people. Paul is going to say, but for the believer, it's different. We, we grieve when someone dies. When Richard died, Susan is grieving. But she does not grieve as one who has no hope. Because for the believer, there is a hope. There's a hope for the future. And Paul is going to say, not only is there hope for the future, but the resurrection should change how you think about life even now. It's possible to believe and to know the facts of the resurrection, but not to realize the significance of the resurrection for your life. Jesus left an empty tomb. And because of that, Paul says, we should live differently in this life. This Rolling Stone tomb was not the tomb that Jesus was uh, placed in. We're not absolutely for sure exactly which tomb that was. Two different tombs have been suggested in uh, the city of Jerusalem. Neither one of them any longer have a rolling stone there. Uh, but this uh, tomb is in Jerusalem. It's just in the uh, park behind the King David Hotel. This was King Herod's family tomb. King Herod will be buried out at the Herodium, but he made this tomb for his family. It was a rich man's tomb. And the reason that the rolling stone has not been taken away is that he caused a, a little notch to be carved into the rock, and then the rolling stone was placed in that, and it hasn't been able to be taken away very easily. You would have to lift it up, and so vandals have not got at it. But it symbolizes the tomb that Christ rose from and left it empty. So if Christ is risen from the dead, if we too will not remain in the grave, if we too have a future and eternal life with Christ and the Father, the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, how should this affect you and how should it affect me? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, Therefore, my beloved brothers, speaking of the family of God, we could say brothers and sisters, be steadfast. It's very, very interesting the application that Paul makes. He says, I want you to be firmly fixed in your belief, settled in what you believe. The resurrection of Jesus Christ should settle your mind. See, most people who commit suicide have all sorts of thoughts flowing through them. They don't know what's right and what's wrong and what's of value and, and what's of worth. They don't know their, their own worth. If Jesus Christ died for you, you're of tremendous value. And if he rose again because he wants you to come to be with him, you are greatly loved. You are greatly loved. And so Paul says, I want you to be settled in this. I want you to be steadfast. There are all sorts of people today who are coming along with all sorts of theories, with all sorts of religious ideas, with all sorts of philosophical ideas. And Paul has said at the beginning of this chapter, there is one thing that is most important, that Jesus died. The evidence, the fact that he died, is that he was buried. And then he rose again. Be steadfast in your mind. When the challenges of life come to you, when you get the diagnosis of cancer, when you get the diagnosis uh, 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 of, of some disease or whatever, what will your mind think of? Paul says, you can be sure of this. Christ has died. He's been raised from the dead, and you too will be raised from the dead. He goes on to say, not only should you be steadfast in your mind, settled in your mind, but he goes on to say, be immovable. 
it's similar to being steadfast, but I think that this is talking about the strength of the will. The resurrection not only settles the mind, but it strengthens the will. Refuse to compromise or to dumb down the belief in the resurrection. There are many Christians today who are trying to somehow appease the world around them and and change their their beliefs so that they're not quite as offensive to to a, a modern world that doesn't like the supernatural. But Paul says, be immovable in your belief of the resurrection. Don't compromise. This was not just a a spiritual resurrection. This was not just a a figment of someone's imagination. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, spends a lot of time giving the facts of the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you believe the resurrection as a believer, it can cause you not to be swayed. There are all sorts of beliefs that will come along, and especially when you are hurting, that will cause you to sway. Are you really sure about this? He says, be immovable, be immovable. But but the resurrection not only is something that happens in the mind and the will, but it affects your actions. He says, be always abounding in the work of the Lord. If the resurrection is true, and it is, and if someday you will be resurrected to be in the presence of the Lord, it should cause you to ask the question, so what should I do right now? How should my life be spent right now? Should I just withdraw from life? Should I just try and avoid as much as possible any pain? Should I just try and be as comfortable as I can? Should I only think of myself? And Paul comes along and says, I want you to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. You see, a belief in the resurrection will cause us to strive, to to exceed the requirements in the work of the Lord. It's not a matter of saying, how little can I do for the Lord, but how much can I do for the Lord? You see, if Jesus Christ has died and has been buried and raised from the dead, and he has, then you have a message that can change people's lives. There are people, not only the ones committing suicide, but the ones who are living around you, where where you go to work, where where you go to school, who do not have any secured hope for the future. They're living for something that allows them to continue to live. And in fact, they may have a hope that is based upon some sort of philosophy. Philosophy. But no other religion can come to you and say, the person who founded our religion conquered death. See, death is what every person will experience. It's a result of the fall. When God created Adam and Eve, he did not create them to die. He created them that they might live forever with him and bring honor and glory to him as they ruled and reigned on this earth. But our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, decided that they would not listen to the word of God, but they would strike off on their own to decide what for them was right and what for them was would bring pleasure. They saw the fruit. (laughs) It was good to the eyes. It it was pleasing to them. They, They thought it could make them wise. And so they took and they ate. And because of that, death entered into this world. And every single person who is born will die. 
but you have the information that could cause them not to live forever apart from the Lord, but rather you have the information that allows a person to come into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll talk about this more in the second hour. But the gospel is really quite simple. It's to believe that Christ died on your behalf. Because he had no sin, he didn't need to die. Unlike Adam and Eve, and like, unlike every single person on the face of the earth, the, the, there was no requirement for him to die because he had never broken the law. He had never sinned. And so he chose to go to the cross of Calvary, not for his own sin, the scripture says, but for our sin. Say, well, how could one man die for millions and millions of people? Because he was not just a man, he was the God-man. He was the eternal God who had taken upon himself the form of human. And when he died, his sacrifice was good, not just for one other person, but was good for anyone who would believe. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so you and I have this wonderful, wonderful message that we can share with those round about us, that, that they don't need to fear death. Now you say, well, Stephen, I'm a believer, and I, I believe that, but I'm not exactly looking forward to death. There's a little bit of fear in me, if you want to know for sure, and we understand that, because death is an enemy. Death is not something that God designed that we should look forward to, but we do not have to face the consequences of eternally being separated from God. We fear death because there is some unknown. <laughs> and unless we truly believe the word of God, then everything becomes an unknown. And, and I don't know all that will happen, but Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We, we don't go into a soul sleep. That, that person who dies is not remaining in the ground, his spirit, his eternal soul is with the one who loved him. And until his resurrected body, Paul says, you're, you're in the very presence of your Lord. That's good news. That's good news. Some of your friends may not even be asking the question, what will happen when I die? If I didn't know the answer to that, I'd probably avoid the question too. And I would make sure that my life is filled with lots of things that will bring a measure of pleasure to me, a measure of success. I would work extremely hard in school so that I could accomplish something, perhaps something that few other people are able to accomplish. I would work extremely hard at my vocation. I would want there to be a measure of success. I would work hard at the relationship with my wife and my children so, so that, that, that when I die, someone will miss me. King Herod did not work hard in his relationship with his wife. In fact, he had his favorite wife out of four killed. Then he felt bad about it, so he placed her body in honey to preserve it and kept her around. He had two of his sons who looked like they had leadership ability drowned in a pool. He was paranoid. And when he took sick and he was down there at Jericho, he demanded that they round up all of the leading Jewish um, elders and, and professionals from that whole area, and he put them into the hippodrome down there in Jericho, and he ordered his soldiers that when he died, that they would kill all of those Jewish people, perhaps up to 7,000. He said, there will be weeping on the day I die. 
Isn't that a terrible thing? He knew that no one was going to weep for him, that there might be a party instead. As it turns out, his son Archelaus did not have all those Jewish people killed, although Archelaus went on to be a terrible, terrible ruler like Herod. This was the man who had killed all the babies in Bethlehem. This was the man who had, had gone after all sorts of anybody who defied him. He, I think, knew that when he died, no one would miss him. But, but, but there are people who, who do things positively so that when they die, someone will miss them. They will give money to an organization so that their name will be put on a building or on a pew or on a, a pulpit or something so that at least in some way they will be remembered. Paul says, do you want to make use of this life? Do you want to have this life as something that is significant? Then I want to encourage you to abound in the work of the Lord. Why do you abound in the work of the Lord? Not for our salvation. We do not work for our salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith, Paul says in Ephesians. It's not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast. We do not work for our salvation. We work out our salvation. A, a Christian who doesn't abound in the work of the Lord is a bit of an oxymoron. That is, he has received the most wonderful gift, the gift of eternal life, but he offers very little in return to the one who has saved him. All of you who attend Bayside know that I've received a kidney from my sister. When my sister gave me that kidney, she gave it to me without any strings attached. That's what she told me. I told her, I said, well, when I die, you can have the kidney back. She said, I don't want the kidney back. She said, I've given it to you. She said, if I read the scripture correct, I'm going to get a brand new body. I don't need that old kidney back. If she didn't mind giving me her kidney and she doesn't want it back, maybe I don't need to be thankful. No, that would be a terrible, terrible attitude. Whenever I see my sister, Eleanor, I give her the biggest hug and kiss. Now, I greet all my brothers and sisters. I'm thankful for every one of them. But I hold her just a few minutes longer. I whisper things in her ear because I realize that, that I have physical life because of a kidney that she gave to me 29 years ago. I'm thankful for her. I, I, I'm not trying to pay her for the kidney. I can't pay her for the kidney. But my heart is a heart of gratitude. And so Paul is suggesting here that we abound in the work of the Lord, not merely out of a sense of, of duty or obligation, but really out of an attitude of gratitude. We get to do this. Our motivation for service, Lord, is not mere obligation, but out of a grateful heart for what he has done. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. You see, if, if I spent my whole life teaching you that if you only did this exercise or ate this vitamin or did this, that, that somehow that would, would preserve your life and that you would have no problems. And then it didn't quite happen that way. I would have taught in vain. But Paul is saying when we talk about the resurrection, when we are steadfast in our belief, when we are immovable in our will, when we abound in our actions, we understand that this is not just for this life, but it's not in vain. It is good. It's valuable. There will be rewards for resurrection living. What you do for the Lord has eternal value. Our pastor is preaching in our home church this morning, and then at, I think, 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he'll be getting on a plane to go over to Hungary. 
Those of you who know uh, me well know that I've got a family living in Hungary. I asked him, how much can you bring over to our kids? He said, well, I do need to bring some clothes, so leave me a little space in my suitcase. I said, okay. I said, I'll, uh, I'll give you an extra suitcase. Can you take that? He said, sure. So we've got 50 pounds of shoes and candy and marshmallows and peanut but all the things that they can't get there in Hungary, so they're going to have a great Easter tomorrow. I text them today, happy Easter, but, but their Easter is going to occur tomorrow. We've got a little granddaughter, Madeline. I think she's turning eight tomorrow, so it'll be her birthday. But we made sure that we had lots of stuff for all the other kids as well. And so Madeline and Juliet and Eloise and Isaac are going to tear into the... Why? Because we love them. Because it's not that we're trying to earn their love. It's just we want to show them how much we love them. What you do for the Lord has eternal value. Those marshmallows won't last. That candy won't last. When I arrive there in November, my grandkids will have their empty hands held out again. And if I say to them, but remember back there in April when I sent you that, that that's, that's gone. They're hungry again. They need something more. They've grown out of their shoes and they need... But when you serve the Lord... There is eternal value. Someday you'll be standing before the Lord and you will have a chance to take the crowns, the rewards that he's given you, and you've got a chance to lay them at his feet. I believe your worship will be deeper the more you've worked for the Lord with proper motives. You will have something to present to the Lord. So what is the application? To do all I can with all I have until I no longer can. Are you making use of each and every day? You say, well, I'm older and I can't do what I used to do when I'm younger. The Lord is not expecting you to do what you can't do. He's just asking you to do what you can if you don't have money, he's not expecting you to give what you don't have. But if you do have it, he would be delighted if you would make that available to him to take care of the needs of others. You won't be able to take anything with you. Whatever you're going to do for the Lord needs to be done in this life. Paul in Galatians says it a slightly different way. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. The longer we live the Christian life, we should not become more complacent, more apathetic, more withdrawn. But, but the longer we live the Christian life, the deeper we appreciate Good Friday for being so good for us. The, the, the more we appreciate Easter Sunday for being the resurrection day, the more we want to share. A.W. Tozer once said, one of the greatest foes of the church is religious complacency. We have fallen, he said, to our present state of carnality from a lack of spiritual desire. Among the many who profess faith in the Lord, scarcely one in a thousand possesses any real passion for God. He wrote that decades ago. And what he said decades ago, I think, could be true today. So, so what does Paul make as the application for the believers in the Corinthian church? He says, I want you to be steadfast. Don't, don't compromise on the resurrection. I want you to be immovable. Don't, don't start to backslide. Don't be swayed by this. Paul has given them proof for the resurrection in both the fact that it fulfilled Scripture, 
prophecy and the fact that it had, the resurrected Christ had been seen by over 500 different people and the fact that the resurrected Christ had changed his life. And because of that, he says, I want you to to be steadfast, to be immovable, to be abounding in the work of the Lord. This week, I believe Christ will give you and he will give me opportunity to abound in his work. There will be opportunities that will come to you. That, that person beside you who needs a word of encouragement, that person beside you who just needs a a cup of coffee and a conversation, that, that person beside you who needs to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. You see, I believe that God gives each one of us moments each and every day to abound in his work. The question is, will you, will you take a, advantage of that opportunity? Or will you place it aside and say, There'll be another time. There might not be another time. So do it because you know that your work for the Lord is not in vain. Let's pray together. Father, please forgive us for coming on Easter Sunday morning and celebrating with a smile and with a new dress and a new tie or whatever we might have brought and and, and celebrating and not letting that affect our lives this coming week. And so, Father, I pray that as we contemplate in this next hour again the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you would find that it has changed our lives, those who have believed, that we might love you more serve you more enthusiastically, knowing that our labor is not in vain. Father, be with us, not only today, but this week, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.